Rock's Backseas Musical Podcast. Back in March, I interviewed rock journalist Tom Bozier about his book, Nothing But a Good Time. The book was a compilation of over 150 different interviews conducted with musicians, producers, and record executives about the music of the late 1980s, which is often dismissed as glam metal, released by what was known as, at the time, hair bands. And while they were unfairly lumped into the same classification, partially due to the timing of their most productive period, the band Tesla were something much more than that. Tesla were something different, perhaps more authentic, maybe even more credible than most, because while there were bands running up and down the Hollywood Strip in Deglo spandex pants, Tesla were just a bunch of guys from Sacramento, 375 miles north of Los Angeles, playing songs that would still be played on the radio more than 30 years later. This was a bunch of guys that would go on to sell more than 14 million records in the United States alone without the spandex, without the goofy makeup, and without much of the pretense that defined much of the music being released in the late 1980s and early 90s. Instead, they were releasing some of the biggest rock songs of the decade with songs like Little Susie, Heaven's Trail, The Way It Is, and of course, the enormously successful ballad Love Song. They also struck platinum with the unplugged version of the five-man electrical band's 1971 single Signs. This was a band whose first three records also went platinum and held their own against other successful bands like Guns N' Roses, Bon Jovi, Motley Crue, and Poison. What's even more amazing is that this was a band that was founded by bass player Brian Wheat and guitarist Frank Hannon when they were just 15 years old. Tesla has just released an updated unplugged album called The Five Man London Jam, recorded at Abbey Road Studios back in 2019. There's also new music on the way, and the band is set to hit the road this year, first with Styx and then later with Leonard Skinner. This is my conversation with Tesla co-founder Frank Hannon on Baxi's Musical Podcast. I, I got to say, I've done, a, I've done as much research on Tesla as I possibly can, and I'm surprised by a, you know, a band that sold as many records as you have that not enough people have actually written about you. It's like I, I'm, I'm kind of surprised by that. It's almost like you know Brian Wheat's book is almost the definitive statement of Tesla. It's really weird. <laughs> yeah, you know, we were always kind of the underdog of the 80s. Uh, when when uh, we were out back then, we had trouble getting in magazines and I don't know why, but, you know, we have a great fan base and we got a, a big catalog of songs. And so we're pretty grateful for what we got. And uh, but we are kind of the underdog rock and roll band. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's, it's been 34 years since the last time I, I saw you guys play live. And I was I was working for a radio station back, uh, you know, back then when you when you came out with your first record. And it's like we were working for a radio station that was. I mean, for all intents and purposes, I mean, if if it was a, a hair band or a glam rock band, that station was going to play it. And when I saw you guys play, I thought, this is everything that those bands were not. I mean, this is just a straight ahead rock and roll band with without a whole lot of pretense. I mean, there was no 35 minute guitar solo. There wasn't a whole lot of spandex on a 90 degree day. I mean, you guys were just a, a just a, a solid rock and roll band back then so to have lumped you in with all of those other kinds of classifications to me always seemed to be like you said kind of like a lone like almost like a lone wolf you're you know out in the desert by by yourselves tesla was something always very different from what else was out there well hey man thanks for saying that and i appreciate it you know it's uh that was an era of the 80s was an era of uh everything was wide open full on you know, everything was on 10 and, uh, <laughs> you know, so, uh, it, <laughs> it was... we were, we were from a small town. We we're a small town band. We come from Sacramento area, which is up North. Uh, you know, Jeff Keith comes from a really small town called Georgetown. And, uh, we played the bars and the clubs and we, we, uh, we played a lot of, uh, uh, paid our dues a lot in the clubs and small town, you know, situations, but we didn't, you know, grow up in Hollywood or anything glamorous like that. So yeah. that was all kind of foreign to us. And and you and Brian started the band off pretty young. I mean, you and I are, are about the same age. I think it's only like a couple of weeks that separates us, uh, you know, age-wise. But, I mean, at the, if I'm getting this right, 
you would have been 14, 15 years old at the time you guys started playing together? Yeah, that's right. And he was 18 uh, and I was 15. And uh, he had just graduated high school. And uh, I, I left school at 16. I took a test and got my GED test because I, I knew that I was going to pursue music. Um, I started very young and I was always the youngest guy in the band. Hmm. Uh, but, uh, you know, I was always around older kids when I was uh, really young uh, because of my guitar playing. So, uh, yeah, it's been a long, crazy, strange trip. I just watched a movie about the Grateful Dead and Bob Weir. He was 16 when he had joined them. So it's kind of the same thing. <laughs> it's It's amazing to me when you hear about a kid, you know, that young, just finding those right people to play in, in, a, in a band that has great success because, I mean, you mean, how many musicians have that opportunity to play with those right guys for the, re you know, for the rest of their career? I mean, that's, that's like a, a needle in a haystack type of situation. Yeah. You know, especially for a band like Tesla who came from a small town, but you know, Brian Wheat and I, uh, we're kindred spirits in a sense that we both had a lot of drive and a lot of ambition uh, we, you know, we were we weren't really the greatest players by any means compared to a lot of guys in our in our town in our neighborhood. But we had more drive than any of them, and that led us to finding a local manager who recognized our work ethic and our drive, and he pushed us to to meet other people. And one thing led to another. We met Ronnie Montrose, who was a guitar legend at the time, and he uh, he saw our drive and. Uh, Along with that drive and ambition, you know, our our musicianship started getting better, and so it all started developing. But it starts off; you got to have a lot of gumption and drive to 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 make it in music. That's for dang sure. So, how did you guys hook up with a guy who's eight years older than you, like Jeff Keith? Well, uh, Brian and I had uh, our band Earthshaker, and we were playing some like you know '80s hard rock stuff when we were we were kids. Uh, this is 1982. And uh, we were playing ACDC and Scorpions and and the first Def Leppard record had first come out and Iron Maiden and stuff like that. We were really influenced by the heavy stuff. But we couldn't get any gigs locally because they all wanted the top 40 dance music. We changed our name from Earthshaker to City Kid. That was City Kid was our knockoff of Loverboy. You know, that was what was really super popular at the time. And we used to play Loverboy songs, and we used to play uh, the pop music, but we hated it at the time. You know, we were we wanted to rock. And then when we met Ronnie Montrose, he's the one that suggested, hey, guys, get back to playing rock. Come on, you know you want to. <laughs> <laughs> so we started writing songs that ended up on our first album, like Coming At You Live and Modern Day Cowboy and stuff like that. We started writing them kind of songs. But in the middle of that, we had another singer who... He wanted to continue playing the pop music, and he didn't want to rock. He wanted to, to be in the pop top 40 band in Sacramento. So he was quitting the band, and on the night that he was quitting, he had told some girls that we knew that he was going to quit. And those girls thought that that was bull bullshit. So <laughs> they, uh, they, uh, they had a friend that they knew from uh, a little country town, it was Jeff Keith, and they, they knew he could sing really good and that he had a natural talent. And so these girls brought him down, and they asked me if he could sit in on a song because they knew that our singer was planning on quitting. And so Jeff Keith sat in with us, and I heard his voice and immediately knew that he was definitely a unique, raspy, killer rock and roll, natural, gifted singer, but he didn't know how to hold the microphone. So... It was feedback and squealing and causing all kinds of mayhem in the show. And all the guys were looking at me like, who is this guy? What the heck is he doing? He can't sing. And I said, after the show, I said, man, guys, this guy can really sing. He just needs to learn how to hold the microphone. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine you know, people go up to Jeff Keith and say, listen, we got a perfect band for you to sing with. Oh, by the way, they're only 15 and 16 years old. Well, you know, he was only 15 and 16 in his mind. <laughs> he's one of these guys that's still 15 years old, and he's pushing 62. <laughs> it's uh, I, I talked about classification uh, a, a little bit, and, and I know that when you're starting a, you know, a band, you're really trying to find 
your voice. And, and, and it sounds like what Ronnie Montrose is telling you is, is exactly that. It's like, you know, you, you want to be able to fit into a box as you just learn how to play your instruments and learn how to play together. But at some point you just figure it out. You know, what is this band really all about? And, and I, and I talked about getting the right guys and, and the right chemistry. And it sounds like, you know, once you and Brian and, and, and Jeff, started to to feel that out that's exactly what you guys did just organically creates itself when you realize okay let's be ourselves rather than try to be mike reno and lover boy yeah yeah once we got jeff keith in the band and uh we were writing our own songs uh we started phasing out the cover tunes and and instead of playing um Rock of Ages by Def Leppard or something, we would write our own song, Rock Me to the Top, and, and do our own version of rock. You know, So once Jeff Keith got in the group and had that voice, uh, he would come over to my house and we would make recordings on my four track. And it was just so fun because I would write a song like Getting Better on the guitar and he would sing it and it would just immediately sound like us. It would sound great. So it was uh, it was really fun to to discover that early on, and then the final element was when our drummer quit. We got Troy Laquetta playing drums, and right. his drumming is so for us at the time was so big and professional sounding because he had already made a record with Eric Martin and he had already toured with Journey, and so he was a more experienced uh, musician. And when he got in the band, it really made made us sound like uh, a real rock band at that point. You know, I, I, I mentioned that I, I started working at a radio station, you know, back in the eighties when when you guys were just coming out, and it, you know, it was a it was a time when you know Guns and Roses was out with their first record, and everybody was looking for that next big hit. And then your first album comes out, Mechanical Resonance, and one of the things I, I and I completely forgot that this was that this was true. You know, one of the first singles that comes off of that, or certainly you know, maybe the commercial break for, through from an album, was was Little Susie. And I completely forgot that that was, in fact, a cover song by by Ph.D. from 1981. And I'm looking at uh, the video on, on YouTube today of Ph.D. singing that song. What a shitty video that was. It's a little oh, a yeah. horrible you know, video. That's an, that's an example of uh, a guy like Ronnie Montrose he heard he knew the, of that song and he heard the potential in the song and he uh he suggested that we covered it and uh it turned out to be a a a really good song for us but if you heard the original yeah it was nothing like the way we did it absolutely absolutely not and in fact to, to the point where your version is so much better than than the original from from top to bottom but that's interesting that that Ronnie Montrose you know, saw that and said, this is a great song for, for you guys. Uh, he was always a hero of ours. You know, when we were kids, the Montrose album is such a rock and roll iconic album. You know, that's the first album that Sammy Hagar uh, sang on. So we were, you know, really influenced by him. But he, he uh, started taking his interest in producing young and up and coming bands, being a producer uh, later in his career. And that's what... Uh, motivated him to come to Sacramento from San Francisco and just search out local talent, which he did. He came to a bar and he heard us playing, paying our dues. And, uh, he offered to help, help us and become a coach. And we remained friends, uh, up until the day he died. Uh, you know, he, we were, we were buddies. In fact, I saw him about two weeks previous to him passing away. We got together mm -hmm. and, uh, had dinner and, you know, so yeah, he was a big part of our lives. When you uh, released that first record, the trajectory to go from just a small town band to all of a sudden you got a platinum record on your hands. The speed... well, no, it wasn't all of a sudden, man. We we toured on that. It didn't go platinum for a couple of years. We weren't an overnight success, man. We we uh, paid our dues pretty pretty hard, and we toured. Well, I'll tell you a story. Uh, Modern Day Cowboy was released on Headbangers Ball and, uh, in the summer of 86. And we didn't go, go out and do any uh, gigs until December when we got hooked up with David Lee Roth and we supported him. I was working for a company picking up garbage and taking it to the dump. 
and Modern Day Cowboy was on the radio, and I was sweating my my ass off in a in a, a little dump truck with no air conditioning, hearing my song on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it, it it the record finally uh, did go gold after we toured and opened for everybody, man. Poison, Great White, uh, Alice Cooper. We did a tour with as a support act. But I, I mean, I remember. You know, playing you know, that album and and playing those records and and it was yeah, obviously it's not an overnight success for you for you know disc jockeys and 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 listeners of that record. It does seem like you kind of came out of nowhere to have a, an album that was just loaded with with great songs. And the next record was even better than that. And and that's really where you, you guys show that this was this was a band to be reckoned with. And especially you know especially during that time when there were so many bands that were that were more focused on image than the music and it was like in in some ways it that whole 80s early 90s time period was kind of it's kind of like the have and have nots there were some bands that 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 had the talent and there were some bands that didn't have enough talent to support the notoriety that they that they received i'm sure you must have felt the the same way that you you guys were you know compared to these bands but so much but so different than, than any of it. Well, thanks, man. At the time, you know, I didn't even realize what was going on. I was 19, 20 years old and not even really knowing what we were doing. And, and, and I knew we were working our butts off and having a great time living our, our goal. Um, but uh, looking back on it, yeah, that was an interesting era, man, the 80s. And you had your bands that were really flashy and then you had your bands that were just really gritty and real, you know, and... Uh, Guns N' Roses album came out after after Mechanical Resonance and Black Crows and a lot of bands did manage to uh, to stay true to their roots and you know it just comes down to what we learned from Ronnie is you know write some gutsy songs that you feel that you can that you can be proud of and Jeff I think because he was a little bit older than us uh, he's really emphasized writing some lyrics that he could really believe in. And so uh, we didn't write any cheesy uh, party lyrics that were that didn't have any value to them. Um, Jeff wrote lyrics that were from his heart, and uh, I'm grateful that he did. When, when, I, when I think of a song like uh, like Love Song, there were so many ballads coming out at that time, but that's one that still gets played today when so many of the, those others have kind of faded away, all those other great you know, ballads at the time. But Love Song is one that just has connected to people that's a song that's going to be played forever. I mean, that's just a, a, a timeless, beautiful ballad. Thanks a lot, man. I appreciate that. You know, that, that little acoustic thing that I played at the beginning, um, it's just so basic and so simple, but I was, I was really feeling it when, when I wrote it and I get offered to play at weddings. <laughs> so it's, 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 it's been a, a, a good, uh, good little p- friendly piece of music for me, but, the lyrics, next time you listen to Love Song, and, and all of you out there that are listening to this, when you hear the song, it's really a song that's about consoling a friend who's who's going through a breakup. And uh, mm. I think that's what put the extra little, the, the little twist to it, is that from the point of view of trying to help somebody or something. And uh, that's, that's what Jeff's lyrics and his messages in the Tesla songs... Uh, always had that reflect like hang tough and you know the way it is and and it's not what you got it's what you give and the life you live and songs that have a message of trying to help help people and help the world have a positive feeling one of the things that uh, that i remember about the 80s is, is there was a certain culture about the music industry that is very very different than it is today and you know in some ways that's good and in some ways maybe not so good because it's it's a it's a slightly more difficult, uh, you know, animal to attack when you release music or you release a record. But back in the eighties, I mean, I remember specifically record reps coming to radio stations with a stack of, of records and, and trying to push, you know, particular songs. And if that meant that the program director had to get a kilo of Coke on his desk to get to that song on the radio, then that's what it took. And, and you don't see that in the very same way today. It's like the, the role of the record company has completely changed over the last 
30 years. How, how do you see it different today than it was back then? Well, you're you're right. There's there's not as much coke anymore. Um, <laughs> That's be what... funny. You brought the coke up, so I thought I'd <laughs> touch on that. Um, well, no, all joking aside, the uh, the it has the the industry and the technology has changed on every level uh, of music production to how we hear music, how we make music, and how we share it, it has. Uh, a lot of great aspects to it. The, I mean, I get, I hear a lot of negative things about technology, but the fact is, is anybody that's really hungry to be a, a, an artist and a musician now can do it themselves independently and not have to, you know, bang on the door and hope that a record company will sign them. So if you're a, a truly talented musician, you can create your own stuff and put it out there into the world and it'll get on somebody's iPhone and they'll, they'll hear it and see it if they like it, you know? So yeah. it's created a lot of freedom artistically, but at the same time, it's also uh, created the technology is so advanced now that people can create music, but they don't even know how to play an instrument, you know? So right. it's a double edged sword, the way, the way things have changed. Um, but the one thing they can't take away is the live concert feeling. And uh, thank goodness this COVID thing is, is about over and we're all going to get back to the real live concerts. And uh, that's what we really pride ourselves in is being able to play a live energy rock and roll show live. Yeah, I want to I, I ask you about that because, you know, you were supposed to go on tour last year and obviously with, with COVID that was, that was derailed. But you guys are going to be playing from – August to November. In fact, you'll be coming through uh, Massachusetts and Mansfield on September 23rd to get back on the road after, after all this time must just feel so, it must feel so good to actually get back and, and play in front of people again. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, some of the stuff that I was really burnt out on, like being on a tour bus, I'm actually looking forward to, to getting <laughs> in my bunk and being on a bus again. It's the break was good. Uh, we needed a break. Uh, Tesla had been, Going at it like gangbusters since 2000. Uh, we made the Into the Now album. We went to Europe. Uh, we got Dave Root in the band. We did Real to Real. Uh, we 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 toured the states numerous times, opening for Def Leppard and Styx and Ario Speedwagon. We made uh, Simplicity, uh, Forevermore. I mean, we really hammered it hard. So the break was was actually really good for us to take during this. Uh, last year and a half and uh we're uh really anxious and fired up now to get back to it you're uh you also released you know, in the middle of uh, of all this the five man uh london jam live at abbey road from a, a show back from 2019 I, I listened to it i think it sounds it sounds terrific it's similar to the the five man acoustical jam from 21 years ago but in some ways it i think it sounds even just a little bit more fresh well, I appreciate you saying that, man. Yeah, we were celebrating actually the 30th anniversary of the Five Man Acoustical Jam. It's it's so hard to believe that that was 30 years ago. 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so in order to celebrate anniversary of our Five Man Acoustic Jam album, uh, we we re- we wanted to do another show, uh, but we got the opportunity to do our show at Abbey Road Studios. The only thing that was really missing on that. Uh, new anniversary thing there is an audience, you know, <laughs> audience played a big role. Uh, our fans played a big role on that five man acoustic jam album that we put out live from Philadelphia with signs on it. Um, the Abbey road thing was definitely uh, an amazing experience being in that studio, but uh, there was no audience. It, it, it was kind of hard to really get into it. <laughs> was it really? Yeah, it was, it was, it was a trip, man, because here we are in this, legendary beautiful awesome <laughs> studio that the beatles made all their albums in and uh we're playing a show and there was like you know, maybe like five or ten journalists there and that was it and they were all just kind of like <laughs> looking at us like uh taking notes <laughs> you, know? you know it was it, weird it's it's funny I've, I've talked to people who have been in abbey road studios and I, and I don't know if you feel this but they but they have always said we're almost afraid to touch anything. Like, should we even be here? It was like one of those weird situations where like the room is bigger than everybody else. 
so many great albums have done there. Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd, uh, you know, the Beatles, obviously. Uh, I know the Stones. I mean, a lot of great artists recorded timeless music in that place. But, you know, the, the staff was really cool. And they actually um, let us touch the walls and actually touch John Lennon's piano. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we got to play Paul McCartney's uh, organ that they had in there. It was really cool. We got to see the tape machine that Pink Floyd recorded their uh, Dark Side of the Moon album on. Wow. And, uh, yeah, it was really neat. Last year, Brian Wheat released a book called uh, Son of a Milkman. He talks a lot about what had gone on in his life, you know, with the band and, and him him personally. When it, when you have a, a, a guy that you've been so close to for, for all that time and you know he may be struggling or maybe you don't know uh, he, he's struggling, you're still all human beings. You're still all all friends. But as a, as a band member, as a friend of his, to see him go through some of the things that he's gone through, what was your feeling about about that stuff? Uh, well, you know, I, I did uh, live the story, so I, I haven't read his book, but I, a lot of people have told me about some of the things that he's talked about in there, and, you know, a lot of things I knew about, but a lot of things I didn't know about, you know, uh, that he revealed. You know, all of us in, our, in the group spent so much time together that, it's kind of a situation where we all each had our own personal problems and uh, crises going on, divorces and kids and, and, you know, real life struggles going on. So I didn't realize that he was going through some of the stuff he was going through at the, you know, at the time that he talks about in his book. But, uh, you know, we, we all try to meet together for the purpose of playing music and we get so absorbed in the music that, when you're in a band, you, you, you get lost in the music of it and you don't realize what your bandmates are going through on a personal level right. a lot of the times, you know. But you do, in, in, in a sense, you know, kind of you know, rally around each other, too, because you do all have a, a common goal uh, together, which I, which I assume in, in some ways must be very helpful for all of you. Yeah, you know, once we get in, in into the, uh, the zone of, playing music together and, uh, you know, not being apart, you know, it got to the point to where we were together so much that when we were not together, we, we all split up and went our separate ways. Right. And so a lot of us weren't even really involved in each other's personal lives very much because when we were together, it was more about really just coming together with the music. Uh, we supported each other to it to a degree, but then, then we'd leave each other alone yeah. at the same time. You know what I mean? No, I totally understand what you mean. I totally do. I also know what it's like to be in a long partnership with people and to try to, you know, go through, you know, go through your life professionally and then, you know, be concerned about, you know, are they doing okay? Am I doing okay? Are we doing okay together? Yeah. The thing was though, with Tesla and, you know, with Brian or myself, we all were struggling with our own personal life hardships of divorces and and problems but we had so many problems that were affecting our music with our former guitar player mm. that a lot of time was spent on trying to to get that guy straightened out and rehabbing him for the sake of the music so a lot of attention was was wasted on that uh, problem you know what i mean so yeah. sometimes you know there's Unfortunately, even in partnerships or marriages, there's other problems that are too distracting from, you know, problems that should be looked at are getting uh, neglected by a bigger problem. So with the uh, the new album, the Five Man London uh, London Jam, are you guys talking about maybe doing new music together or are you just going to you know rest on this one for a little bit and see what happens? No, we uh, we have a brand new single that's coming out. It's called Cold Blue Steel. Uh, JK and I wrote it, uh, about two months ago. Uh, I was in my garage playing my guitar. <laughs> he showed up to, to come over and jam with me. And, uh, he was listening to Leonard Skinner's Saturday night special at the time and was rocking out to Ronnie Van Zant's lyrics and his message in that song. And so we wanted to do our own little spin on that. And we got influenced by Leonard Skinner and, wrote our own new song called Cold Blue Seal, and it's coming out August 27th. And we're really excited about it because we produced it ourselves. It's really raw and not over-polished. 
it's edgy. It's got mistakes in it, and it sounds killer. And you also had a single out uh, not too long ago called uh, Ride Strong with Aaron Lee from Y&T and Kelly, uh, Kelly Nobles from Rail. Tell me about that. Well, yeah, you did your homework. That's that's uh, <laughs> Ride Strong is a, a, a song that I put out uh, as Frank Hannon. I hate the word solo artist. You know, I'm not a, you know, a solo Solo is a guy that's by himself. I'm just an artist. I play in Tesla, but I also do my own thing. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, so, but so people can understand. Yeah. As I put out a solo uh, single, it's called Ride Strong. And Kelly Nobles is a drummer from a band called Rail that was one of my favorite bands in the 80s. We used to open for them. And he plays double bass drumming, which is some of my favorite uh, style of drumming. And that, for, you know, was really popular in the eighties and he's like a master of it. And I really wanted to have some, some uh, double bass drumming in my song. And so uh, I called up Kelly and I sent him the track and he played drums on it and sent it back to me. And uh, it's, it's a rocker, man. Yeah. It's, it's a pumper. I, I, I saw the, the video and you, and you, and you show him playing, you know, the double bass, which is, which is a, uh, you know, a very specific skill that not a lot of drummers have at least not to do it great. I mean, there's a lot of guys who can do it, but uh, to do to be really good at it, that's that takes real skill. Yeah. So Kelly Nobles is doing that, and Aaron Lee is the bass player on the project. Uh, he's he's my friend who plays in Y and T. We've been friends for years, and uh, the three of us uh, recorded that that song. And it's a song about survival and and having the attitude of kicking ass right from the start, man. You got to just give it all you got. And that's what the song's about. I, I can't wait to hear the new, uh, the new stuff. I can't wait to see you on the road. Congratulations on the new record. And, uh, it is a real pleasure to talk to you. Same here, man. I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, have me on your show. The new album by Tesla is the five man London jam from Abbey road studios. And like I said, there's new music on the way. And if you like the show, subscribe, share with all your friends and follow along on Facebook and Instagram at Faxi's fun bag. I'd also like to hear what you think. You can reach me at BaxRock102.com. And again, thanks for listening to Baxi's Musical Podcast.